the First World War. A new condition emerged that caught the military and medical establishment completely off guard. There was no telling who would be affected by it or why. Those who suffered from it might be hypnotized or electrocuted, rested or shot, all for the same illness. So many men were lost to it, there would be a revolution in military attitudes and a new field of medicine created. The condition was called shell shock. These are the men whose minds the dead have ravished. Memory fingers in their hair of murders. Multitudinous murders they once witnessed. The war on the Western Front was different from any war fought before. New machines dominated the fighting. Modern factories produced gas and high explosives, used for the first time on an industrial scale. Sustained shelling caused horrific injuries and dismemberment, testing the endurance of Britain's soldiers. You were living in a land of impossibility, death, blood, mud, pouring with rain, boiled with sun. You could have run away for it for miles. And if I hadn't have had a command, I, th I think I should have run away. I think I couldn't have stuck it. No one, from new recruits to experienced officers, was prepared for trench warfare. Traditional ideas of courage and cowardice were slowly eroded as the misery of the conflict took its toll. Every time a, a shell came back or, or dropped near you, you were on the, on the shakes. But um, you've got to try and control that. Some would laugh it off, others would be uh, shaky or a bit nervous about it. Um, but you, you've got uh, anybody who, who it seems to be a bit too frightened, you, you've got to try and pat them on the back and say, come on, old boy, you're all right. From the very outset, casualties were heavy. Soldiers returning from the front were overwhelmed by the brutality of this war. Dr. Charles Myers, a pioneering psychologist, was appalled by the suffering of trench warfare. In October 1914, he decided to offer his services to the military. My father was very, very concerned about conditions out there and he moved about from hospital to hospital and in many cases he went up to the dressing stations very close to the firing line and saw these um, men directly they came out from the firing line and he was he was pleased he was so near because he could undertake treatment for them straight away after their disasters uh, with the bombs soon after his arrival in france Myers treated a private who had been trapped in barbed wire in no man's land. Although several shells had burst nearby, the soldier was untouched. But ever since the explosions, he had been partially blind. Myers was intrigued. He could find no physical cause for the man's condition. Other similar cases, mostly from the ranks, soon came to his notice. In February 1915, he reported his findings to the Lancet and concluded that the bursting of a shell had caused an invisibly fine molecular commotion in the soldier's brain. In other words, a physical shock to the nervous system had caused the strange symptoms. From this, he coined the term shell shock. I suppose shell shock uh, made much sense. It, it captured exactly what was happening. There were lots of shells around, there was lots of blast, lots of shock, and People, after being blown up or buried after being blown up, um, were in a state of shock. So it, I think it, it was a wonderful term because it described it quite perfectly. To the army's alarm, 
more and more cases of shell shock began to appear. After just six months of war, 15% of the British Army was judged to be suffering from the condition. The most extreme cases were blind, deaf, mute or shaking, yet all without an apparent cause, other than their proximity to bombardment. Similar cases appeared in the French and German armies on the Western Front. The shell shot are the symptoms of a mental person. All the signs and symptoms, shaking, head shaking, hands shaking, body shaking, they, they were, in other words, they weren't themselves. They had to be nursed, taken to the toilets and all that sort of business. They weren't fit to be left on their own. I mean to say, if you had a few shells bursting round you, you wouldn't feel you wouldn't feel so happy, would you? The medical press highlighted the worrying number of cases. The British medical journals stirred up interest by reporting examples such as a sergeant with a paralyzed trigger finger who could no longer fire a rifle. The term shell shock became the common description for any soldier suffering an unexplained problem. Preventative measures had to be taken. In March 1915, the Army appointed Dr. Myers as consultant neurologist to deal with the growing problem. But Myers was already concerned that the term shell shock was a complete misnomer. He found that many of the casualties who were labeled under that definition had never been near a bomb uh, to suffer from the shell shock that most people feel associated with bombardment. And it was just their psychological problems that uh, had accounted for the, the disastrous mental state. Myers realized that the causes of shell shock were far more complex than he'd first thought. He was now convinced that shell shock was not a physical problem, but a mental one. Soldiers' unconscious minds so distressed by war crippled their bodies and took them out of the fighting. The military found it hard to accept such a radical theory. It undermined the belief that men could and should control their fears and emotions. Captain Herbert Leland was an officer in his mid-forties who had fought in numerous campaigns. From the trenches, he wrote almost daily to his wife, Lena. His letters are the personal testimony of a man's struggle to maintain his sanity. I was at the front this morning. You could not believe the scene of desolation. Mud, muck, misery and melancholy reign supreme. And a pitiless bombardment adds to the general discomfort. Death and glory, I suppose they call it. All my friends are gone. Not a soul to go to, even for a chad. How I do wish I could tell you some things. I dare not, of course, for you would never get my letters. One of the senior officers saw my grandfather and said, Leland, uh, these bombs don't seem to affect you. And uh, he says, little does he know. But what is the point of hiding? You get used to it, but it still actually affects you very much. When you see so much death, you obviously believe that perhaps the next bullet or the next barrage will, will have your name on it. And it is fearful. Some weeks, some people were frightfully brave and yet the following week, they could hardly hold things together at all. It's a variable entity. Fear of death, fear of being afraid, seeing so much death. Really a nightmare. So how do you cope with it? I don't know. How do you prepare for it? I don't know. Perhaps you can't. By the end of 1915, the British Army had suffered half a million casualties. 13,000 were diagnosed as shell shock. 
The milder cases were treated by Myers and his colleagues in France. The more severely affected men, referred to by the army as noisy mental cases, were sent back to Britain. At first, the men were treated as if they were lunatics, and therefore incurable. But at Myers' urging, special shell-shock hospitals were set up. One of these was the Royal Victoria Military Hospital at Netley in Hampshire. The aim was to segregate shell-shock men and to test new methods of treatment. We used to walk across the fields to the hospital, and these fields were all covered in tents. There was hundreds of these tents. And uh, my mother used to keep on to me, shh, shh, don't make a noise. Well, why, Mum, why? Well, they're shell-shocked patients and they can't stand the slightest sound. This footage, filmed at the Royal Victoria at the height of the war, is an extraordinary record of the impact of war on the minds of men. The doctors, feeling their way, decided that the men were suffering from hysterical conversion symptoms. That is, the men's mental distress produced a physical symptom, rigid limbs, extreme shivering, or loss of speech. In this case, a deaf man responds only to the word bomb. Somehow the mind splits itself off from the body, that they're almost two distinct entities. And we see this after exposure to very traumatic and upsetting events. We know that some of the war psychiatrists talk about people going blind because they just can't bear seeing the carnage around them. The doctors at Netley began to classify the different symptoms. They gave their patients' conditions outlandish names. Hysterical dancing gait. Hysterical slippery ice gait. and battling with the wind. Treatment at this stage was basic. Massage, bed rest and a milk diet. As a new phenomenon, shell shock sparked enormous interest in the medical community. Everyone wanted to find a cure. And the army gave doctors a free hand. In July 1916, the Battle of the Somme began on the Western Front. 20,000 men died on the first day. In five months, over half a million Allied troops were wounded or killed. For miles, in, in every direction, it was just desolation. When you first see it, you think, my God, what, what's this? Everything swept to the ground, just piles of bricks, tree, tree stumps sticking up for miles and miles. The whole of the Somme area, to me, was like that. Death? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's the first time I'd ever seen death. <laughs> it, um, it was so shocking on the first time that one, no, uh, you, and then after that, it was 
it was that's I'm not going to be this I I'll run away from it sort of business <laughs> because of you never ever did of course and you see in my case I was in charge of a large number of, of men now officers who had not been affected in large numbers were beginning to break down when confronted by the loss of so many of their men Guy Botwright was a platoon commander in the Labour Corps in charge of 36 men he was 17 years old I was probably censoring letters and an explosion might have taken place um, something I had a pencil you see and it would have been I would have dropped everything and and the mind would have gone blank and I think that's what must have happened because I can't tell you waiting in the trench for something to come along to take me away I had no no pain so there was no feeling of pain because I hadn't been wounded or in any kind, any shape or form but I couldn't concentrate I have no idea what the doctors gave me for it I couldn't tell you because the world had ceased to exist I think <laughs> Guy Botwright was diagnosed with shell shock. He was evacuated to a specialist officer's hospital in Brighton. Officers' shell shock often differed from the other ranks. Stammering, loss of memory and irritability were all common symptoms. Captain Leland wrote to his wife, I feel I'm an awful wreck these days. The weather does not suit me. I'm sorry to say that my temper is such that few come near me, just as well. I should love to get some leave, but I don't like to ask. It was suggested to me the other day, but in such a way that if I had risen to it, I should have felt that I was shirking. You could see from his letters, he was crying out to be given a rest, given a break. Had he been given a break, he probably would have been able to continue uh, indefinitely. But without that break, you see it getting worse, getting through to him. Shell shock was creating a loss of manpower. And this slowly but surely became more and more obvious, but it became blindingly obvious um, at the Battle of the Somme when 35,000 men broke down. And the army authorities could not ignore this anymore. They had actually been working towards this. The work of Myers and others had been treating and were treating people successfully up until this time. But this was the real major loss. It had been learned from previous wars that disease, um, injuries, they could certainly cut your manpower down. But now they had to accept that the psychological response to warfare could do the same. In response to the crisis, the War Office took action. More specialist hospitals were opened throughout the country. Moss Side Military Hospital at Magal in Liverpool had room for 500 patients, all from the ranks. Under Dr. Richard Rouse, a Freudian psychologist, a team of doctors were recruited to treat the shell-shocked men. The army, usually conservative in such matters, was so desperate for a solution to the problem that they were happy to place their faith in the new treatment. The Magal doctors believed that the cause of the men's condition was a traumatic event which had been repressed and now lurked in their unconscious. The trauma might be revealed through the analysis of their dreams. The theory suggested that if you recounted your tale, if you recounted your nightmares, if you talked about it, 
felt the emotion with the story, you could let it go. It would somehow lose its power of control over you. Dream analysis seemed to work. In 1916, Richard Rouse, the medical superintendent at McGull, wrote about his methods in The Lancet. He described one man who was tormented by a fearful nightmare. In his sleep, he was heard to shout, It was an accidental shot. Yes, Major, it was not my fault. Exploring the man's unconscious mind revealed his terrible secret. It emerged that the man had mistakenly shot a wounded comrade crawling back to the lines through no man's land. After unburdening himself of this memory, the patient was healed. It was the birth of the talking cure. The psychoanalysts had to probe deeper and deeper, which made it very terrible for those looking on, which was a sister of staff nurse. Mary Jolly worked alongside the psychoanalysts at another military hospital, the Radcliffe in Nottingham. She helped nurse the most traumatized. Many of them were being asked questions that were distressing them very much. But the psychoanalysts had to get to know what was causing the trouble. There was one instance where the psychoanalyst was trying to get out of the man's mind and he was having great difficulty in probing and in the end he got it out that he had seen tanks go into battle and lying in the path of the tanks he was wounded men. They just mowed over them. They had to go on. Your emotions were disturbed too, you know, because they disturbed you, you know. It was a painful thing to see a man quite out of control. Not good to see a man in tears. And you had to be there. That was distressing for those looking on. Many of the McGull doctors, like psychologist Tom Peer, developed a genuine sympathy for their patients. Working class men who, in peacetime, they would never have had the opportunity to treat. My father felt very deeply for them, there's no doubt about that. And he would tell you of a particular case and this man's background and the sort of family that he came from and that the families would not understand this was the sad thing that even when the chap was so-called cured and some of them went back to the front and some of them didn't but he was afraid that their families would never be able to understand what had happened the revolutionary methods pioneered at McGill were a success two-thirds of those discharged were declared fit only to be sent back to the slaughter. The McGull doctors never forgot that curing a patient might send him back to the very cause of his breakdown, the fighting in France. It was an ethical dilemma at the heart of their work. I think my father would have been extremely unhappy at the idea that this medical treatment that he was helping to give would be um, used in order to sign them off as fit and send them back to the trenches. I'm quite sure it would be a, a very sad thing, but he didn't talk about that. And in a way, of course, that hospital was run as a military hospital. He was under military discipline. The army was always concerned, with some justice, that men might be faking shell shock in order to escape military service. This man pretended that he couldn't keep food down. He vomited back any meal that he was given. And he didn't lose weight. And he was seen to get a parcel of food over the fence. His wife had come on one side of the fence. 
so that he was not undernourished, and that was why he wasn't losing weight. That was malingering. The problem was that without an obvious physical wound, it was very difficult to tell the difference between a man who was shirking and one who had genuine symptoms of mental distress. Of course, the real debate is whether this is unconscious or consciously created. And I think that's where a lot of the difficulties came along. Were well, these people malingering? This is a, a great theme throughout military psychiatry. And all of the psychiatrists I've read say that malingering was rare. In June 1916, the War Office formally recognized that shell shock was a genuine war wound and had ordered that the condition should be treated as such. But unofficially, many continued to regard it as no more than cowardice. A case of shell shock could devastate the morale of a unit. Senior officers feared it was contagious, and harsh measures were often taken to prevent it from spreading. The officer was uh, perhaps in charge of a group, and one fella cracks up. He's got to, uh, the officer has got to be careful or to watch that the rest of his men don't crack up with him. Uh, there have been cases, I believe, even of men being shot by their officer for absolute cowardice, which, which the, the poor fella can't help it. But uh, he, he's just broken down. Although shell shock was now recognized by the war office as a medical illness, it could not be used as a form of defense at a court martial. A soldier charged with cowardice or desertion was either insane or responsible for his actions and should be shot. Private Harry Farr was a 26 year old Londoner serving with the 1st West Yorkshire Regiment. He had been in France since the outbreak of war and had spent months in the trenches. In May 1915, father was um, put into hospital at Le Havre and he was suffering from shell shock. Well, he'd always written to mother and kept in her posted of how things were going, but the letters that came from him in the hospital, he had to dictate to the nurse because he was so traumatized, his hands were shaken so much, he just couldn't write the letter. And that was the last letter that mother ever got from my father. Far was returned to the front to fight at the Somme. There he felt his nerves giving way once again. In September 1916, he broke down and refused to go up the line to the trenches at Guillemont. He was charged with cowardice and court-martialed in October. At the court-martial, Farr defended himself. I reported to the sergeant major and told him I was sick and could not stand it. He then said, you are a sodding coward and you will go to the trenches. I give sod all for my life and I give sod all for guns and I'll get you sodding well shot. When he was court-martialed, I think it was because he refused this time to actually go over the top. Not because he didn't want to fight, I'm sure of that, because he'd been out in France for two years, but because he, he didn't want, to, he just couldn't face the gunfire and he just felt so traumatized by it all that he just couldn't face it. He said himself in his own defense that when he was away from the gunfire, he felt all right. The fact that Farr had spent five months in hospital in 1915 with shell shock and had been in and out of dressing stations since that time with nervous problems was not admissible during the trial. He had no other defense. Harry Farr was found guilty of cowardice. The court-martial lasted only 20 minutes. The charge of cowardice seems clearly proved. The man is definitely bad to say the least of it. I therefore recommend that the sentence be carried out. Mother received a letter from the war office stating that my father had died and that he had been shot for cowardice on uh, October the 18th, 1916. And that was all, no apology, no nothing, just a letter. <laughs> 
and she says she has told us since that she was so shocked she had a blouse on at the moment and she pushed this letter down in between the blouse and she never told a soul. Shortly after receiving the letter, Mrs. Farr got some solace from her vicar, who had been contacted by the padre attending the execution. There was a padre there that stood there and watched my father when he was shot. And he said my father stood there open-eyed, refused a blindfold, and he said he was no coward, he was a very brave soldier. The shame of his execution remained with Gertrude Farr for the rest of her life. She kept it secret until shortly before her death at the age of 99. Shell shock was not a problem confined to the British trenches. All armies faced the problem of weeding out malingerers and treating genuine cases. Yet as the war progressed, treatments improved. German doctors favored hypnotism. This German soldier is being treated for extreme and continuous shaking. In France, a different type of therapy was used. It was called Faradization, after the Englishman Faraday who discovered electricity. Currents of electricity were applied to the affected areas and produced remarkable results. Faradization quickly caught on in Britain. At the forefront of the treatment was Dr. Lewis Yeland. The basis of my father's treatment was to convince the patient that they were not deaf, they were not mute, or as the case may be, they were not paralyzed. And I suppose he did this in two ways, was what, one by talking, and secondly by demonstrating that uh, the patient could speak, could hear, or could move a limb with various techniques such as electrical stimuli. As with the French, electricity stimulated the nerve endings, proving to the patient that his paralyzed limbs or vocal cords could and would work. Almost all those treated were cured, for the time being at least. Dr. Yeelan's use of electricity was so effective that he was regarded as a miracle worker. In his memoirs, he recalls the case of A1, a private aged 24, so traumatized by three years of combat that he was mute. For nine months, he had not spoken a word. Finally, the patient was sent to Yeelan, who locked the surgery doors and placed an electric probe in his throat. I said firmly to him, you will leave the room when you are speaking. You are already doing splendidly, and I am satisfied that you are now determined to talk, and I am very pleased with you. I firmly held him in the chair and said to him, it is getting late. I may have to use a stronger current. One must remember at the time, the aims of treatment were partly to get patients better as quickly as possible in the hope that some would be able to return to duty and long periods of psychoanalysis would not achieve that aim. I mean the alternative was if these patients didn't go get better they might spend the rest of their lives as um, invalids. I then applied shock after shock to the posterior wall of the pharynx commanding him each time to say Ah, in expiration. I continued with the faradism until he could repeat ah distinctly. And I did not discontinue its use until he was able to repeat any letter or any word I ordered him to say. When he was able to repeat the days of the week, he became very pleased. Doctor, doctor, I am champion, he said. <laughs> 
confidence in the ability to cure the most difficult cases was growing. No matter how extreme the physical symptoms, British doctors felt able to meet the challenge. In 1917, a charismatic new doctor arrived at the Royal Victoria Hospital, Arthur Hurst. He favoured hypnotism. His treatment had dramatic results. Hurst looked after some of the men filmed here and kept detailed notes of their progress. Corporal Anderson had developed a curious walk after falling ill in Salonica. Dr. Hurst wrote, He found he could not walk owing to the pain, but he could get along by a sort of dancing gait in which he slid each foot backwards about half a pace every time it touched the ground. I explained to him that the gait, which had at first been the means of saving him from pain, had now become a bad habit, and that he must now try and cure himself by copying every movement I made when I walked. By the next morning, greatly to his delight, he was walking quite normally, and now found it difficult to reproduce his old dancing gait. But some men were so deeply troubled by their experiences, they were beyond help. Some of the sisters had a birthday, and they said it was a pity they had no drink. And one girl said she would get on a bicycle and go down and get a bottle of something, I don't know what. And when she was coming back, she heard a sort of coughing noise, and she thought, I'd better go and investigate what that is. Halfway she thought, oh no, it's a sheep or something. However, she did go over, and when she went over, she found that man had cut his throat. She had a petticoat on a pair of scissors, and she burned him up as well as she could, and then she got on a bicycle and went back to the hospital. He was put on a chart, I suppose. He was in bed, and his hands had to be outside the bed clothes all the time. And there was one probationer there they had to make do with what they had. And... Uh, she was lurking with one of the orderlies, and she took her eyes off the man, and he put his tra trachea, he had a trachea otomy down, and he put his hand and pushed his finger down, pushed his tube down the throat, died. Carelessness. Distressing, very distressing sometimes. Did what he could for them, diverted them perhaps was most, probably most of the, what he could do. And I was very young, I was only 24. I hadn't all the knowledge or the wisdom that I should have had. Shortly before Christmas 1917, Captain Herbert Leland finally broke down. He was evacuated back to Britain. You will be very sorry to see that I am in the officer's hospital. I don't know how you will take it, but personally I am very sick. The doctors insist on my having a complete rest away from the sound of guns, and I am to go home for at least a month. Don't worry, it is not my fault. Being a proud military man, I think uh, the effect of giving in to weakness uh, and being taken out of the battle without being physically wounded uh, was something that uh, he was very ashamed of. And again, he, he's conscious that his wife and family might feel shame. It wasn't done.
The stigma of shell shock was such that officers were not meant to break down, but many, like Herbert Leland, did. These officers were found to be suffering from a neurosis that was born out of prolonged and exhausting exposure to war. Doctors called it neurasthenia. The use of this term helped avoid the more embarrassing diagnosis of shell shock on their medical records. There obviously had to be an understanding of what was happening to not only the men, but the officer class as well. How could people with VCs, DSOs, how could they break down? So not just society, but more particularly perhaps the um, military hierarchy had to try and come to some understanding as to what was happening. Craig Lockett, Military Hospital for Officers, on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Before the war, it was an asylum for the wealthy. As such, it was considered suitable for neurasthenic officers and was converted in 1916. The war poet Siegfried Sassoon was treated here in 1917. Sassoon described Craig Lockett as a large mausoleum of a place, a live museum of war neuroses. By night, the hospital became sepulchral and oppressive with saturations of war experience. One lay awake and listened to feet padding along passages which smelt of stale cigarette smoke. One became conscious that the place was full of men whose slumbers were morbid and terrifying. Around me was that underworld of dreams haunted by submerged memories of warfare and its intolerable shocks and self-lacerating failures to achieve the impossible. One figure above all dominated Craig Lockett, the psychologist William Rivers. Dr. Rivers believed that his patients should confront the horrors to which they had been subjected. The basis of Rivers' approach was going back to the story, going back to the event not just telling the story but the event with the emotion that you had to have the emotion and the story to um, come to terms with the experience to make peace with the experience to uh, accept it and move on in your life otherwise you'll be stuck Rivers central belief was that shell shock was the result of a conflict between self-preservation and the obligation to stay and fight. Soldiers became so worn down struggling between the two impulses that they became physically ill, especially after four long years of war. Rivers' ability to engage with these shattered young men earned their lasting respect and, in some cases, devotion. John Harry Burns was one of these men. He had been buried alive in a church during the bombardment of Arras in 1917. He had lost all but two of his 200 men and suffered a total mental collapse. He was sent to Craig Lockhart, where he was treated by Rivers and his team. From Craig Lockhart, he wrote, At present, my nerves are in a very poor state. The slightest noise affects my heart. I suffer very much through insomnia and also have acute pains in my head. I shall remain for a considerable time incapacitated. Day trips and social activities were encouraged as part of the treatment. Byrne's wife would often come and visit. But despite their best efforts, they could make little progress. Memories of the war continued to haunt Harry Burns. His principal doctors felt that they just hadn't opened his mind at all. He was purposely closing it. And I think that what was what he wanted to do was to find the men that he'd been lost with, that had lost I mean, that day, and there were about 200 of them, and to find their discs and find their bones and help in the very end of them. Rivers suggested to Byrne's wife that his only chance of recovery was to take him back to France to lay his ghosts to rest. 
the idea of actually revisiting the scene of past traumas grew out of Rivers' belief that men should not hide from their experiences. The end of the war in November 1918 gave Burns and many others like him the opportunity to make peace with themselves on the Western Front. My mother and his sister willingly took him and they were there for six months. And they met the Canadian War Graves Commission and my father was able to stay back with the officer for some months. And they found a great number of the things he'd been fretting about limbs and the, the identification discs of his men. It seemed it was his salvation. My mother always used to tell me that if it hadn't been for Craig Lockett, we might never have got Daddy back. Rivers and his colleagues treating shell shock during the Great War changed forever the perception and treatment of the damaged mind. There was no longer a rigid distinction between the mad and the sane. Instead, there was a new understanding of temporary mental breakdown to which anyone could fall victim. Shell shock and the psychological reactions to uh, the battlefields of the First War, I think for the first time allowed us to negotiate within society that external events could affect you internally that perfectly normal, rational, brave, courageous human beings could be brought to tears, could mentally break down, lose their emotions, and actually regain control again. Psychology then became much more popular, and people for the first time realized that um, psychology has a deep um, understanding of why people do what they do or don't do what they don't do and that it's connected with all sorts of fears and angst and apprehension and dreams and that kind of thing and I think for the first time perhaps people became interested in the mental troubles that uh, ordinary people might have. Some 200,000 men were shell-shocked during the war. Many were cured, but for others, the awful memories of war continued to dominate their lives. In 1921, three years after the war, nearly 15,000 men were still in hospital. Others, like Harry Burns, had to cope as best they could. My father never got over the terrible trauma of the war but he was able somehow to keep it at bay pretty well but uh, I always remember uh, his horrific shouting and screaming in the night and it was really dreadful and my mother trying to calm him down and everything but of course I didn't see anything unusual about it went on every night and that was it I thought everybody's daddy did things like that at night and cowered under the bed and howled and screamed. The Great War had devastated the nation and in the years that followed people tried to put their suffering behind them. The lessons about shell shock so hurriedly learned during the war were quickly put aside by the military in peacetime. Its new discipline, military psychiatry, lay dormant. But only 20 years after armistice, another conflict would break out. And once more, the horrors of war would ravish the minds of fighting men. And the way the condition was treated in the Second World War is examined next Sunday at...